The Unshackled Waves, episode 83. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. We will have Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts join us in a moment for the weekly review show. But first in the final change to the format of our show, we will now start with a rundown of the week's news, which will include my own take on it. This will be called Right Now, so let's have the first instalment. In Australia this week, uh, more specifically the state of Victoria, uh, we had the biggest attack on free speech yet. Uh, This was the Bendigo Three were found guilty of breaching the state's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. Uh, Blair Cottrell, leader of the United Patriots Front, uh, Christopher Shortius and Neil Erickson were fined $2,000 each, but they will uh, appeal. Uh, This was for a mock beheading that they performed in Bendigo in 2015 to promote their rally against the city's proposed mosque. The verdict basically sends a message to the community at large that you cannot link Islam to terrorism or even mock Islamic State. While Neil Erickson was in Melbourne for the trial, he and people associated with the Party for Freedom gatecrashed a Yarra City Council meeting on Tuesday night to protest their recent uh, decision to scrap Australia Day. Uh, It was criticised by much of the media who fear the so-called far right and claim it is rising, Uh, but the left uses these types of disruption tactics all the time and it's about time they got a taste of their own medicine. Uh, The High Court today, uh, there was a a challenge to the uh, same-sex marriage postal plebiscite to be conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Uh, This was because it has been conducted without parliamentary uh, approval. Uh, This was dismissed today, so this means that the Australian people will finally have their say on the issue. But both the yes and no campaigns have already been underway, including some very unsavoury attacks launched on the mothers appearing in the first no commercial. Father's Day is a date that has been celebrated for centuries, but has now been sadly politicised. There was a push by a leftist academic to rename it Special Persons Day, and Free TV Australia pulled an ad about Father's Day uh, from the organisation Dads for Kids, as they believed it was linked to the same-sex marriage plebiscite somehow. It expects the question, will all future Father's Day materials be required to have political authorisation? It's interesting to note that only Father's Day is attacked uh, uh, as it is a day to celebrate masculinity, while Mother's Day is not subjected to the same attacks. Meanwhile, the High Court, it seems, is not as expedient in determining if people uh, making the laws are, are actually eligible to be in the Parliament. They will not hear the uh, eligibility cases of a number of uh, federal uh, MPs and senators until October. So in the meantime, the Labour Party this week, when Parliament resumed, has uh, tried to suspend standing orders nearly every day as they are trying to get the uh, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce to stand aside while his case is before the the High Court since uh, his eligibility is under a cloud. Decisions made by him currently are under question. Uh, We just hope that this uh, uncertainty is resolved and I don't understand why the Turnbull government can't just allow Barnaby Joyce to stand aside like they did for Matt Canavan. Meanwhile, the Turnbull government is desperate to do something to stop increasing power prices and has this week looked at ways to prevent uh, uh, New South Wales coal-fired power stations scheduled for closure in 2020 uh, open. Uh, This follows Turnbull's second uh, summit last week with energy companies. Of course, they still will not look at winding back the renewable energy target, which is uh, uh, driving up energy prices or even uh, dare question the alleged climate change consensus. 
The United States is in the middle of what they call hurricane season. Hurricane Harvey has uh, devastated southeastern Texas. At this point in time, it has resulted in 71 fatalities and over $70 billion worth of damage. The response from the government agencies uh, such as FEMA has been let adequate, unlike in previous hurricanes. However, the, the media cannot let an event like this go uh, past without criticising President Trump. They have done this over superficial things such as him wearing his MAGA hat while uh, touring the damage, uh, Melania wearing high heels and claiming that Trump should have hugged the victims. Uh, they, they're criticising him over these things because they can't find any actual real criticisms uh, with his handling of the uh, disaster and his administration's response. Islamic State has disturbingly moved into Southeast Asia with an insurgency in the southern Philippines. This is a reminder that Islamic State is not confined to the Middle East and is a worldwide movement. And despite what some Australians may think of Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte, the Australian government offering him assistance to fight Islamic State is in our national interest because we don't want you know, Islam, Islamization and Islamic State right on our doorstep. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome to the show. Uh, it's good to be back, Tim. It's good to be back for another uh, Unshackled Waves episode. Uh, well, we've still got you listed as Unshackled Contributor, but you're pretty much my permanent co-host now, so I think we need to sort out a, a proper title for you. Yeah, that wouldn't be too bad, Tim. I'm um, definitely, oh, I'd say I'm the Peter Credlin to the Tony Abbott at the moment. I think that's my position. So uh, definitely, definitely happy to be back and definitely happy to contribute to such a great website. Uh, interesting uh, comparison there, but uh, we'll uh, get straight into the first topic this week. The High Court ruled today that the same-sex marriage plebiscite, which will be conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which is why it's now being referred to as a survey, because it's a voluntary postal plebiscite. The High Court ruled uh, after uh, two days of arguments that it could proceed, so we will finally get this issue of same-sex marriage resolved one way or the other. Now, despite the uncertainty with the uh, court challenge, uh, the, the campaigns from the yes and the, the no sides have already got uh, underway. And we saw the first no campaign aired uh, last week, which actually didn't mention uh, same-sex marriage itself, but uh, brought in the, what they refer to as the flow and effect that uh, programs like Safe Schools will, will just end up getting worse. A lot of people, when they heard the, the words of our um, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, just thought that he was getting a bit senile and a bit giddy and he was just mouthing off at the back bench. But we can see that it is a complete package. You um, allow this to happen and it can open up a can of worms. Uh, Mark Latham, the Daily Telegraph, wrote a brilliant piece about this, about how uh, ambiguous the legislation regarding same-sex marriage. And I think that there are a lot of questions to be asked. If it's between two people, does that break down our understanding of society being between men and women? Does that open up the 230 plus gender categories? These are all things that we've got to look at. And I think people like Abbott, the Christian Lobby and Latham all raise really good points to this. If it's going to happen, it needs to be watertight legislation and not ambiguously written legislation that doesn't have provisions for religious liberty. Well, Jeff, the issue of like gender identity, and I'm opposed to, you know, the, uh, I initially refer to it as 76 genders, but I've been told there's, it's expanded to like 200 or you know, there's infinity genders now. Like, obviously, you know, that, uh, that is ridiculous. And I, I know that in Victoria, uh, the Daniel Andrews government, they did try to uh, introduce a law to, uh, you could change the, the gender on your birth certificate every six months to male or female or whatever. But I still consider something like that, which is absurd and got de got defeated, to be separate from the the issue of same-sex marriage. I still think that this is 
a plebiscite on that issue. And I think that if the, if these other issues come up, the you know recognition of the infinite genders or you know an even worse version of safe schools, I think that though those issues should be considered separately. I, I don't see that they're they're linked together, and that's what uh, that's what there is a lot of people who uh, you know do support same sex marriage, but you know think you know safe schools is really uh, you know perverse. Safe schools is disgusting. Now, um, <clears throat> my brother uh, goes to a primary school. And he goes home and he tells you about some of the programs and, and some of the stuff that they're taught uh, in those programs. For instance, I, I heard uh, through Mark Latham's channel uh, that, or maybe it was through Christensen, George Christensen's Facebook page, that kids are actually being taught masturbation in school as a part of this Safe Schools program. Now, you know, it should be numeracy, literacy, science. There shouldn't be any of this stuff that's going on with the Safe Schools program. Now you've got the you've got uh, the Safe Schools program instructing people, you know, instructing kids about the use of sex toys and how to masturbate. And uh, this shouldn't really be taught in schools. And in my opinion, uh, as a conservative and as a libertarian, uh, more more so a conservative, but the, these things should be taught by the parent. And it shouldn't be public group think, you know, um, telling um, children, you know, what is good and what is bad. You know, that should be something that is decided by the family, the family unit. But I have to disagree with you before that, Tim, because I believe that these issues are intrinsically linked. I believe that this safe school's gender ideology is linked to this marriage bill because of the ambiguous way in which it's written. It, it inadvertently gives that dogma uh, some kind of legal recognition. But I can, uh, I do believe that linking all of these issues, I mean, it has gotten a bit absurd. Uh, uh, Tony Abbott at one stage linked the attacks on Australia Day to uh, same-sex marriage and has said if you're against political correctness, you should vote no, which is that like, Australia Day and same-sex marriage are, are, are not linked. Yep. Uh you're a common sense man, Tim, but I, I guess we, we have to disagree on this. I don't, uh, I, I don't really agree with the concept of same-sex marriage, but it doesn't change my um, look at things that some of these things are linked, for instance, um, but then they're not directly linked. Um, they're indirectly linked. It's when when Abbott says vote no to this, uh, vote no to political correctness, vote no to you know so on and so forth. He's saying that maybe that the people who are actually driving this um, aren't genuine and, and uh, maybe they don't have the best interests at heart when they write it. Maybe they're trying to put forth this gender ideology instead of granting uh, quote-unquote marriage equality. So, yeah. Oh, there's plenty of people who identify as you know, conservative or, or libertarian who, you know, who you know, wouldn't want to be doing it introducing it for these, you know, sinister reasons. Uh, I, there's uh, a book that was published last year, The, the Conservative Case for you know, Same-Sex Marriage, and talks about strengthening the institution of marriage. So not everyone who supports same-sex marriage is, you know, Ros Ward. Yeah, well, um, yeah, well, she is crazy, that woman. Uh, she's back, unfortunately. Like the plague, the plague still hangs around in Madagascar and some dark and deep places of the world. Uh, Roz uh, is uh, at the Guardian, uh, which I think says quite a lot. But um, yeah, we need to be careful. And I think that if we are to put this forth, that we need a legislation, a piece of legislation that is between two women and two men and the like, and I don't think that we should be giving any legal recognition to this anti-science dogma. I can't move an inch on that. But um, the case for strengthening marriage is an interesting one, but uh, it's one that I disagree with because I think that you can still love each other. You've got the same legal recognition as a de facto couple. but. It's I view marriage, it's pre-Christian, it goes back millennia, 
It's between a man and a woman for the purpose of a family. And if you are to allow same-sex marriage, you're, you're giving a vote to commercial surrogacy, which in a sense is putting value on a human life. Um, and you're, you know, we, we, we're interfering in a sense with with natural law and and that's something that I do find disturbing well, well that's the type of you know arguments that I want to hear from the no case and and this is uh, what I'm stressing during this segment is you know don't don't bring the uh, the other issue issues in like you know same-sex marriage or, or Australia Day talk about the issue itself and yes you know we should be considering you know the what uh, you know, same-sex marriage, the implications is for uh, you know fa a family and raising of children. I think they are um, linked to same-sex marriage, but I just don't want us to get go on this tangent as it is to all these other issues which aren't to be considered. Yeah, well, I think there's an indirect link. I think what Abbott's saying is, if you're going to put up with uh, these yes people, you're also going to put up with these Australia Day, anti-Australia Day people and where is it going to end? I don't think there's a direct connection, but there is some connection. He's saying you, you need to say no to this anti-Australia, anti-traditionalist outlook because it's, it's, a destruction, it's a destructionist kind of look on things. It's not, you know, let's build a cohesive society. It's, let's, let's break all this down because it's symbols of, you know, white man, you know, white privilege and, and kind of, uh, you know, capitalistic greed, let's get rid of it, you know, that they're not actually getting, they just want to get rid of all our institutions and that is a big problem. Uh, but there is not a direct connection between uh, people being anti-Australia Day and, um, you know, for same-sex marriage. But what I think what he was saying in a nutshell is that if you're going to put up with one thing, if you're going to put up with the thuggery of the um, the gay lobby, then you're also going to put up with the thuggery of the anti Australia Day lobby. Now you saw on the ad there the woman. Uh, there's one woman who's a pastor. One of these same sex, a pro same sex marriage people said, "I will burn down your church," and another one said, "I will organise a protest in front of your medical clinic and I will stop your career." It's this kind of stuff that Abbott's saying no to, and I think you have to read into what he's saying. You can't take it literally, black and white, like a Puritan would in the 17th century uh, Massachusetts or something like that. You need to, you know, read into what he's saying a bit and understand the context of what's happening in our society. Yeah, what, what happened uh, with the, it was a petition started by Get Up, or then they tried to disassociate themselves from it and said it wasn't started by us, even though all the evidence pointed to that. They started that uh, petition to get the, the doctor who appeared in the ad, uh, Pansy Lau, they wanted the, the AMA and the Australian uh, Medical Practitioners Register to stop her you know, practicing medicine, which uh, of course is disgraceful. Um, that is sort of... Uh, it's, I, I didn't really get too outraged about it, basically because, I don't know, maybe the, the activities that left, they no longer, you know, shock me anymore. Like, I expected them to do something like this, but uh, I still have, you know, faith in, you know, organisations like the AMA that they wouldn't consider, you know, such a, you know, stupid petition and, like, because of her views on, you know, this one subject that apparently, you know, disqualifies her from being a doctor. The AMA is a relatively conservative organisation as well, Tim. I've done a little bit of research into it through researching into euthanasia, and they hold the view that it's not right, okay? So I think they are a relatively conservative, common-sense group. Uh, but, you know, we have to really dig into this, and we have to tell people this day after day, that this thuggery should not be accepted, and uh, that maybe people should vote no until this bullying and this thuggery stops and maybe they should reconsider their mind but you have to look at what they're doing these same-sex marriage people there's like some of them are great you know it's it's the traditionalists you know there's there's good and bad on either side but what happens send let's send any parcel the new matilda says send any parcel you like to the the australian christian lobby okay and then um then a, a gay activist drives a van into the into the front of the Christian lobby and blows that van up, causing a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage, uh, you know, to terrorise and to silence 
uh, pro uh, anti same sex marriage groups uh, into submission. So I think that we can say yes for equality, is if you'd like to call it that, and no to the bullying. And I think that we need to uh, uh, delineate or to separate uh, these issues. We need to say that uh, just like, say, that uh, any kind of right wing politician would have to get rid of the neo Nazis. I think the left has to say, you are on the far left, you activists who believe in violence and intimidation need to, um, you know, sort yourselves out. Well, it's it's definitely going ahead now, the, the plebiscite, so we we can now let, you know, democracy uh, do its work, and I'm sure, well, hopefully there's, uh, as uh, pe people, ho uh, people, you know, claim they want, there's, uh, you know, civil uh, discussions about this where people can agree to disagree. Surely, Tim, we've just had one of those conversations, and I'm sure that, um, in a society, in a free society, that the free market of ideas uh, should be what decides issues and not leftist tyranny uh, that says you can or, can or cannot think a certain idea. So let's uh, vote one for meritocracy and vote one for a free market of ideas. So Father's Day became political this year. Uh, this all started when this uh, academic appeared on Today Tonight Adelaide. Uh, she was called Dr. Red Ruby Scarlet, which is not her real name. She claimed that Father's Day should be changed to Special Person's Day to be more inclusive. Not, not changed to simply uh, Parent's Day, but to Special Person's, which basically can mean anybody. And then we also had the organisation Dads for Kids. Their Father's Day ad was uh, pulled uh, uh, from uh, television by uh, Free TV Australia because it didn't have political authorisation because they claimed it was somehow linked to the same-sex marriage debate. And so, you know, what, what uh, a date that we've celebrated for, you know, centuries is now suddenly controversial. I mean, what's happening? Yeah, well, well obviously, Tim, Father's Day is a symbol of the patriarchy and all the evils of the white man. So I think that we rightly should get rid of it. Uh, and I have to uh, agree with uh, Dr. Cherry Blossom or whatever she goes by because it's simply a side of our, you know, backwards uh, society. Yeah, well, it's, well, it's interesting that uh, Father's Day is attacked, but Mother's Day is never attacked in the same way. That's probably because um, the feminist lobby would be up in arms if, or oh, how dare you attack mothers? But it seems, you know, uh, fathers because they're they're men and they all have, you know, toxic masculinity which they push onto the the next generation, and of course, you know, must be torn down. Yeah, Tim, we can't put up with this toxic masculinity that built the Western world. You know, it's simply terrible. You know, it's given us roads, schools, education, philosophy. You know, we can't put up with it anymore. Um, so I, I think that uh, women are the superior being and we should simply all have a statue in our homes, a gold-plated statue of um, Amy Schumer, and we all must worship it every evening. I think that's the solution to our quarrels. But going back to the commercial, I'm not I'm not sure if um, all of you saw it, but it was it was pretty uh, simple at it. It just had a you know father singing a lullaby to their you know child. It was meant to pay tribute to fathers, but uh, they somehow you know thought that was a political statement. Now, to be fair, and a lot of I, I saw a lot of you know left leftists point this out that Dads for Kids it does oppose same-sex marriage and has made submissions to uh, uh, government inquiries but the ad said nothing about that it was simply about Father's Day they've done this every year for a, for a number of years yeah it's just another sorry about before viewers and listeners I was obviously joking uh, but I think that it is ridiculous that uh, we have an attack on Father's Day. We should both celebrate our mothers and our fathers. Uh, we should, uh, and we shouldn't let this, uh, we shouldn't really give this any more attention than it deserves. Um, 
what will happen next? Will uh, cards, Father's Day cards, have to be approved by the Commonwealth? You know, is that too political? You know, that's that's what's happening next. It's this typical road of leftist censorship and thought control, mind control, that's happening uh, that we shouldn't put up with. We should say no to the people interfering with Father's Day. We should also say no to these these larrikins who are trying to uh, or wanting to uh, replace plaques or change Australia Day. We really need to stand up for ourselves, Tim. Uh, it, it would be quite a bizarre thing for next year onwards if you get a Father's Day card that says Happy Father's Day and then that down the bottom says, you know, authorised by, you know, so-and-so. I mean, like, no, nobody has ever considered, you know, fa a Father's Day political, but of course, you know, it's, it's now being, you know, uh, a question because, of course, it doesn't fit the, you know, LGBT agenda because, of course, you know, we can't assume that, you know, all uh, children now have, you know, uh, mothers and fathers, but, of course, you know, biologically, a child has to have, you know, a mother and father. Of course, there are, you know, children who, you know, sa sadly, you know, might not have a mother and a father for, you know, uh, reasons outside of their control, and that's, you know, unfortunate, but of course, you know, that's, you know, we do, you know, wa want to both, uh, you know, celebrate and also put, put forward the, you know, importance of both the, you know, feminine influence and masculine influence on children, and that's why we have Mother's and Father's Day. Well, the, the Christian outlook on it is it's called uh, uh, it's complementary co-equals that are you know complementary to one another. Um, compl uh, I can't say the word at the moment, but co-equals that are complementary to each other. And I think that that is a good way to look at things. I think that for a society to properly function, you need strong women and you need strong men. And to put fathers down in this way is shocking because behind every strong woman is in most cases a good father, a good uncle or a good brother and uh, behind most strong men is a, is a good sister, a good auntie and a good grandmother. So I think that we need to keep it real and I think that we need to uh, we need to really realise that yes this attack on Father's Day is somewhat connected to the, the attack on marriage. It's just another step down the slippery slope. Now many say that slippery slope slope is a logical fallacy but we can see it taking place here you know there's so many things that are happening the, the attack on father's day the attack on on men that's an attack on the nuclear family um, and it's it's signaling to people that you know men don't really matter you don't need a strong man you don't need a husband uh, just marry the state you'll be fine and I think that this is a very dangerous path that our that our country is going down because uh, the family is is a central unit to the peace and stability of our nation. If we do undermine it, then we are to have serious problems in the future. Statistics show that children who are uh, brought up in a nuclear household tend to earn higher wages, uh, tend to have less likelihood of unemployment and tend to have less likelihood of incarceration. So let's look at the facts and let's look at the science and let's venerate the family, let's venerate the housewife and let's venerate the hard-working father. Yeah, I mean, uh, but of course if you point that out then you know, that's, you know, offensive to, you know, single mothers and all these other groups, which, you know, this is why we point out, you know, we're not, you know, disparaging them. Like, we're saying that, you know, ideally, or as it's called, you know, the gold standard, you know, should be a biological, you know, mother and father. And this, we should say that that is the standard. Now, with um, a key pr a key principle of Christianity is yes, uh, you will always sin, but you don't have your standard as hey well if I'm going to sin I might as well rape and murder my way through life you know I might actually try and, and be a decent person, and I think that that's what we need to have in our laws is you know not Christian like not taking it out of the Old Testament or anything, but just saying that. Our laws should be based on what is the optimum, what is the best thing for children, what is the best thing for society, and we shouldn't make laws on the exceptions to uh, the odd exception to them.
Now, over in the United States, uh, Hurricane Harvey has devastated southeastern uh, Texas, and now an even worse uh, Hurricane Irma is now on its way. They call this in the United States the hurricane season. Now, unlike uh, previous uh, hurricanes, such as Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the response from federal government and local authorities uh, agencies such as FEMA has been adequate, but of course the, the media, they can't let an event like this go to waste without an opportunity to bash tr President Trump. And since his administration have, have pretty much done nothing wrong, they've been picking at superficial things uh, such as, oh, it was inappropriate for him to wear his mega hat, oh, he didn't hug enough victims, even picking at, you know, Melania's heels. I mean, it, it's just been, it's another example of how, you know, the mainstream media aim to, you know, distort the, the narrative. And, you know, it, it's just telling, like, uh, you know, Trump's administration response, it's been, you know, adequate. Why does it matter all these other things? If the left, if the media, if CNN are talking about things like Melania's shoes, what hat Trump is wearing, uh, it really shows you that Trump is probably doing a good job. So I would take that as a complete compliment. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a bit ridiculous. Um, I saw Mark Dice. He's an interesting conspiracy theorist that if you want a bit of entertainment, I suggest you follow. He, he, um, he did some memes because CNN, you know, just ridiculous uh, the way they cover him and so poorly as well. Uh, instead of Trump hugs black child, Trump steals black child. And instead of uh, Trump's hand graces the face of a black child, Trump slaps black child, you know, so I thought that is a, a funny uh, and satirical way to uh, bring out the hypocrisy and the lies of the media in this. Um, yeah, so I, I think that Trump has done an exemplary job and I think that America has learned a lot from Katrina and uh, the, the steps were already in place uh, for most of the South to take care of this action properly. Well, the reason they were having a go at him from wearing, uh, for wearing his mega hat is because apparently he was promoting his line of hats at a time as tragedy and it was inappropriate for him to promote a, com a commercial venture. But he, every time Trump's outdoors, he wears the, uh, the mega hat. I mean, you, you see him at rallies all the time. And I, I don't think he actually wears it for uh, commercial reasons. I think, you know, he wears it so his hair doesn't blow away. I think that's the main reason. And like, uh, like, uh, and the reason why these hats have you know taken off in such a commercial way is because Trump always you know wore it. So like, this is just you know clutching at you know straws, you know having a desperate angle. Yes, it is. Trump wears that hat every time he goes outdoors. Now, if he didn't wear that hat, I would bet that CNN would be attacking him for showing uh, the American youth that um, not wearing products to cover your skin, uh, you know, he's uh, showing that, you know, skin cancer's cool if he wasn't wearing a hat. They'd bend it any which bloody way they would want to, you know, show him in a poor light. And, yeah, I think that you really need to uh, take what CNN, the New York, po uh, the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, uh, BuzzFeed says with a grain of salt. You just, we have to ignore it. Yeah, and, you know, of course they're saying that, oh, but he's, you know, not comforting the victims enough. He's not, you know, sending out, you know, more condolences, you know, paying tribute. It's, it's more proof that the left, they only care about, you know, seeming, you know, rather than doing. I mean, that, like I said, they can't criticise the actual response, so this is why they go after these things. Uh, and, like, I remember, you know, uh, vision of um, President Obama, like a woman was, you know, crying in his arms after a hurricane, he's saying, oh, it's okay. Well, you know, the president, you know, just like patting her on the back, that's not, that's not helping anything. Like, you know, the, the president, you know, what they can really do is, you know, make sure there's resources on the ground, make sure, you know, money's getting in, you know, uh, rescue operations are being coordinated. I mean, that's, you know, action, not, you know, not, you know, just saying virtue signaling, basically. 
Well, I think the left in general, and it's typical with a lot of millennial culture, uh, we're both young and I guess we both fall under that tag, but uh, millennials, in a sense, prefer to have uh, the appearance of being well off or the appearance of doing something. Uh, they love to virtue signal. Um, and that's something that I despise with my kind of generation. But a man like Trump, um, you know, he might be loud and boisterous, but uh, and the whole Republican Party uh, is united around him. Uh, Governor Greg Abbott as well, local authorities, and they're all working hard behind the scenes to actually get things done. And I, I think they're actually caring about saving people's lives and restoring Texas to a state of norm rather than virtue signaling to CNN. So I think they're doing a great job. Uh, and let's not forget that Trump, you know, personally donated $1 million towards the uh, relief effort. I mean, that's, you know, doing more than, you know, any uh, hug could. Well, Tim, this is very interesting because the lefties keep telling us that Trump... You know, he had a small loan of a million dollars and he's terrible, right? You know, his father gave it to him all. But then when he gives a million dollars, it's not enough money. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's what they'll always say. I mean, he didn't have to, you know, give anything. And it should also be pointed out that he's not actually taking a salary as president. Uh, every quarter when he gets his paycheck, he's giving it to a government entity. He gave it to a war memorial. There was another one where he gave it to the Department of Education to fund a... Uh, education uh, camp so you know he's he's doing this you know job for for nothing because you know he he wants to you know basically you know serve serve the people and you know he, he's already you know got enough money well the, the thing here is uh, if Trump's not taking a salary you said he's donating it this is out of his own pocket um, now the left probably could bend this even further. He's uh, he's earned that money off the that the, the backs of um, the the working man, and he's exploiting. And you, you can't win. You, people like Bill Gates are handy in society, or people like Trump are handy in society, because not everyone has the capability to be as well off and as successful as both of those men. And if they are uh, to gain wealth. Um, they give it away. Bill Gates has pretty much cured polio. Trump's given it to war memorials. Trump's actually housed um, black homeless people in his uh, in his hotels and whatnot. Uh, so it's really good having these rich and successful uh, philanthropists that do this work. And it just shows that, that private charity and the work of churches and rich people uh, can do a lot, and we don't necessarily need the government coordinating every element of our life because the free market in many cases can sort the bloody thing out for itself. And of course the, the media, they've also criticising because you're still talking about other issues because you gave a speech uh, talking about, you know, uh, tax reform. Well, you know, the business of government still, you know, has to go on and in case anyone for forgot, you know, there's still a nuclear threat, you know, coming from North Korea as well. I mean, that that's also important. Well, it seems that the situation on the Korean Peninsula has flared up quite a lot. But I have to agree with the Trump administration's stance on this issue because enough is enough from Korea. Um, Bill Clinton gave them nuclear reactors. George H.W. Bush let them off easy. Barack Obama took it for eight years. And it's time that we stand up to these communist thugs who oppress 23 million people and threaten the harmony and peace of the world. Now, most people think that Islamic State is only in the, the Middle East, but it's now arrived in Southeast Asia, which is our own region. Uh, the city of uh, uh, Marawi in the southern Philippines has been under siege from Islamic State recently. And yet yeah, we've also got uh, Muslim nations such as Indonesia, which is taking a more fundamentalist direction as well. So uh, it is something that is coming closer to, to our shores. Now, um, Australia has offered military assistance to the, the Philippines. Um, it's, it's very scary that, you know, it's like we, we tend to think, well, you know, it's Iraq and Syria, but, you know, a, a Islamic State, I mean, its propaganda can be seen worldwide. There's, you know, Muslim populations worldwide. You know, of course, this was bound to happen. 
the scary thing is we've always thought of this terrorism issue as a localised issue to the Middle East, but you, we live um, with the closest nation, our closest neighbour is Indonesia. 250 million Muslims, and you've, you've always got to assume that some of these are going to be fundamentalists, some of these are going to be inspired by the likes of ISIS. Uh, you've got the Philippines, I think a nation of around 90 million people, I may be wrong there, but you know, it's a rather large nation, and you've got whole breakaway provinces and cities that are under the thumb of, of you know, uh, Daesh and groups like that. Uh, Marawi is uh, the town you were talking about before. Um, Duterte's response uh, has been strong, has been emphatic, and it almost shows that if you are to have response, uh, if you are to have an effective response to the terrorism, you need boots on the ground. You can't be doing it by proxies. Uh, you can't be trusting proxies to carry out wars for you. You need to be doing them yourself. Um, I, I don't really, you know, we, meddling in the Middle East is an interesting debate whether we should be doing that or not, but certainly I think sending a tr Australian troops to um, Southeast Asia, to uh, the Philippines is in the interest of our national security and we need to be killing the terrorists on the ground before they come here. Uh, and of course, uh, the Filipino president, Rodrigo Durate, he's a, uh, uh, dare I say, controversial and colourful uh, figure. He's uh, often called the, the Donald Trump of Asia. Uh, he's, he's, he, he's called, uh, you know, uh, ch uh, said, you know, nasty things about, you know, Chelsea Clinton, for example. Uh, but probably uh, the thing that gets him in, oh, gets him the most, you know, criticism in Western nations is his uh, crackdown on the, the drug trade in that country. And I know that there's a, a lot of uh, libertarians who say we shouldn't, you know, be offering any assistance at all because of his horrible uh, human rights abuses because, you know, his crackdown involves things like, you know, summary execution of drug dealers and users. I honestly couldn't care, you know. Some of these libertarians are great. They stick up for classical uh, liberal principles of individualism and, you know, your personal, your personal, you know, property rights and whatnot. But they have to realise the story on the ground is a lot different. You've got whole towns and whole cities that um, have a real problem with methamphetamine, with ice. It's, it's terrorising these communities. It's breaking apart families. Uh, and it's increasing crime. And it flows, the, the drug trade flows in with the child sex tra trafficking. And um, and the like, uh, and the prostitution, and all these things that we that are against basic human rights. Um, so I think that you need to be a bit more pragmatic and just say, uh, and just uh, realise that it is in our national security interest to help the Philippines, uh, and and to stop the, the spread of uh, Islamic fundamentalism within in Asia within our continent. And drugs are also uh, illegal in this country as well. I mean, whether they should be illegal, that's a debate for, a, for another time. But, you know, we've basically got the same, you know, uh, drug, law, uh, drug laws. And, yes, there is, um, you know, a, a problem with, you know, uh, the, the way that Durate is, you know, implementing his, you know, tough on uh, drugs policy. But you have to remember, uh, you know, he was voted in democratically and he's, you know, very popular in the Philippines. Like, he's had approval ratings of close to, you know, 90%. People think that he's, you know, doing a good job. And I noticed with some libertarians, they're, they're non-interventionist on, you know, most foreign policy, but because, you know, uh, Gerate is mean to the druggies, he's got to be hauled before the International Criminal Court. Well, you know, why him out of, you know, all the people in the world? Yeah, and... Yeah, you're right there, and I think that uh, he was voted in democratically, which shows that the people of the Philippines did realise that they had a problem with drugs, and this man said, hey, you know, I'm not going to give a free pass to criminals anymore. I'm not going to put up with this police corruption. I'm going to crack down on corruption, crime, drugs, and I'm going to try and bring some peace, stability, and order to our nation. And I think that if the people want that, and they voted that in, and they expected that, then um, and that's what they've got, then there's no problem with it. Uh, and I think that to say, like, 
uh, that uh, there's no difference between Jurate and Islamic State. I mean, that's a ludicrous statement and, you know, cultural relativism at its worst. Yes, well, one man is the democratically elected president of the Philippines who is instituting policies that he was voted in for, and one is a group that drowns homosexuals and Christians in cages, throws throws gays off roofs, and uh, says that women shouldn't have an education, shouldn't drive, and uh, one man's trying to clean up the country's drug and crime problems. So, yeah, I'm not going on with that lefty claptrap. Uh, that's all we've got time for for, for this week's show. Uh, apologies to our listeners for all the, the wind that occurred during the episode. Um, Jacob's doing this uh, outside, so um, hopefully it's not too distracting. Yep, uh, the wind. You can't control the wind. Unfortunately, you can't control the wind. I'm sorry about that, people, and I hope that hasn't interfered with your listening experience too much. Have a good week, all. And uh, don't listen to any of that lefty claptrap that tells you that Australia isn't a great place. Stay true and stay strong and keep listening to The Unshackled. Oh, thanks again for your company, Jacob. It was great to be back, Tim. Can't wait for next week. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Now, you will notice that Jacob and I did not discuss in detail the trial of the Bendigo Three. That is because myself and associate editor of The Unshackled, Tom Peroni, will be recording a special report show in the next day. Uh, we, will, we were both present there on day one of the trial, so we'll be going through the verdict and its implications in more detail then. A reminder that I set off for New Zealand next Monday, the 11th of September, to cover that nation's general election on Saturday, 23rd of September. I'll be bringing you interviews from candidates and activists, as well as on the ground reports, an election night live stream uh, with the Unshackled in association with Right Minds New Zealand is in the works, so I hope to confirm that soon. And of course, another reminder of an event we've got coming up is then the Unshackled is sponsoring the first ever Liberty Works conference in Brisbane on Saturday the 14th of October 2017. It'll be hosted by our friends at Liberty Works, and you can get a 20% discount on tickets by li visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LFUNSHACK all caps. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.